Seeing what was happening around the world, top American public health officials were increasingly convinced that halting flights from China was not enough. I think most health officials agree that at best it delays and, as the secretary says, kind of pauses things. Dr. Fauci and two other officials plan to confront the president on February 26th. A broad pandemic throughout the world, travel restrictions are not going to help. You can't just travel restrict everyone. The public health officials, Redfield, Anthony Fauci at the NIH, Stephen Hahn at FDA, they had all decided that was going to be the day they were going to tell the president, hey, look, we need to, we need to be more aggressive here. But before they could do that, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, a top CDC official, spoke out publicly. Tonight, the CDC is calling the coronavirus a tremendous health threat. We are working to ready our public health workforce to respond to local cases and the possibility this outbreak could become a pandemic. It was a dire warning. The virus has killed more than 2,200 people and infected nearly 77,000 worldwide. Carter Evans has been... The president was on his way to India. Thank you, Mr. President. There, he was reassuring. You may ask about the uh, coronavirus, which is uh, very well under control in our country. We uh, have very few people with it. But as he prepared to return home, Messonnier spoke to reporters again. Ultimately, we expect we will see community spread in this country. It's not so much a question of if this will happen anymore, but rather more of a question of exactly when this will happen and how many people in this country will have severe illness. Federal health officials said today the coronavirus will certainly begin spreading. It is not a question of if, but when. As Nancy Messonnier is giving this briefing to reporters, the president is just getting on Air Force One in India to fly home. So as he's flying home, the stock market crashes a thousand points. Wall Street continues to sell on those coronavirus fears, the Dow falling close to 900 points today. TV is broadcasting nonstop about how this is going to change the way Americans live. And of course, the president hadn't been briefed on any of this. So by the time Air Force One lands uh, Wednesday morning on the 26th, he's fuming, he's angry. The, the big economic success that he's constantly touting is under assault from his viewpoint. He picks up the phone and calls Azar, yells at Azar, says, you're scaring people to death here, what's going on? But the, but the big consequence of, of that is that the briefing that the public health officials had intended to do for Trump that evening after he'd returned, that briefing never happens. Angry with his public health advisors, Trump refused to meet with them. Talk of more aggressive measures such as stay-at-home orders and strict social distancing was put off. Messonnier's warnings were heresy. They then, the next day, dedicated an entire presidential press conference to walking back the, the warning and the assessment that she had given. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. And with the benefit of a month's hindsight, she was 100 percent right. She accurately anticipated what was about to happen. She tried to warn the country of that. And uh, the White House tried to furiously walk it back. The CDC said yesterday that they believe it's inevitable that the virus will spread in the United States, and it's not a question of if, but when. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I don't think it's inevitable. It probably will. It possibly will. It could be at a very small level, or it could be at a larger level. What, whatever happens, we're totally prepared. We have the best people in the world. As someone who served in government, I can tell you that kind of behavior sends a very, very clear signal to government workers about what is and is not permissible to say. It's interesting that it's very much like what happened in China in late December and early January. The parallels are very, are very striking. I, I think it's immensely irresponsible of people in this administration to be blaming China for that kind of behavior, even as they have engaged in it themselves. Dr. Nancy Messonnier would be sidelined. Alex Azar was removed as head of the task force. He was replaced by Vice President Pence. Mike is going to be in charge, and Mike will report back to me. But he's got a certain talent for this, and uh, I'm going to ask Mike Pence to say a few words, please. Thank you, Mike. What talent Vice President Pence was bringing was not clear. Thank you, Mr. President. When he was governor of Indiana, he had slashed the state's public health budget as a staunch evangelical Christian, 
he had questioned scientific advice. You don't so, feel like you're being replaced. Not in the least. I'm, I, I, when, the pro, when, when this was mentioned to me, I said I was delighted that I get to have the vice president helping in this way. Delighted. Absolutely. The daily press briefings became a platform for the president's positive messaging. You are hearing the line that the risk for Americans is low, which comes from everybody's mouth from the president on down. Mr. President, to follow, how should Americans prepare for this virus? Should they go on with their daily lives, change their routine? What should, what should they do? Well, I hope they don't change their routine, but maybe, Anthony, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you answer that. Or Bob, do you want to answer that? Sure, Mr. President, thank you. I think it's really important that, as I said, the risk at this time is low. The American public needs to go on with their normal lives. Okay. You said February 29th, the risk at this time is low. The American public needs to go on with their normal lives. It was true at that time, Martin. I think the risk was low. But by this time, China had had an outbreak. Ir Iran was in the midst of a, a major outbreak, as was Italy. And you're saying at this time the risk is low. Yeah, well, the risk was low to the general American public at the time. But the fact is that we had stumbled in February to test adequately, to test enough people to know where things were going. How can you say that when we had such inadequate testing? Well, the purpose, I'm sure, of your documentary is to help identify lessons and correct them so we don't repeat this. Many of us are in the arena where, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, we're marred and bloodied. Uh, we're trying to dare greatly. Hopefully, at best, we'll know the triumph of high achievement. And, you know, at worst, we'll fail by daring greatly. Throughout February, the president had continued to hold his rallies. Hello, Phoenix. Hello, Las Vegas. Great to be with you. Where else would you like to be but a Trump rally, right? He blamed others for exaggerating the threat. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. They are politicizing it. And this is their new hoax. The president would not you know, call for social distancing for another two and a half weeks. We have leaders throughout much of January and February saying that this is a hoax. 35,000 people on average die each year from the flu. Did anyone know that? 35,000. And so far, we have lost nobody to coronavirus in the United States. It's a complete denial of, uh, of science and uh, leading to all sorts of decisions that are harmful to our country, to our planet. You're quoting the president. He made these comments. Is it your view that he knew better than that? Or was he simply misinformed? I cannot psychoanalyze the president. But we know that he, he has a tendency to, be, to believe he's the best at everything. And he probably thinks he's better than the scientists. And you wonder the press is in hysteria mode. Fake news and their camera just went off. I think if he were practicing medicine, uh, he would be negligent and he would be prosecuted. The president's behavior, the president's resort to repeated falsehoods is a function of the way he is approaching this crisis. He's approaching this crisis about how it affects his own political survivability and reelectability. Uh, this is a list of uh, the different countries. United States is rated number one, most prepared. I would equate it to something like seeing a hurricane offshore that has just taken out a couple of Caribbean islands and is strengthening to Category 5 as it heads for Florida, and not bothering to tell people to get off the beach and board their windows, and only starting to do that when you see the storm surge coming ashore, by which point it's, of course, far too late. 